Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our session. Um, earlier this year, we at The Economist newspaper published a cover story that looked at the topic of our session today, innovation and whether it is accelerating or decelerating. And on the cover, we had a picture of Rodin's thinker, so boys like this, sitting on a lavatory. And the title was, Will We Ever Invent Anything This Useful Again? It seems a little odd to be pessimistic about innovation at a time when governments, universities, and firms are spending about $1.4 trillion a year on research and development. You know, we're living in an era of smartphones and supercomputers, big data, nanotechnology, gene therapy, and stem cell transplants. So it seems a bit odd, as I said. So in preparing this session, I looked at Quora, the online question and answer site, and I wanted to see if anyone had answered the question, is innovation slowing? And the top rated answer was from an anonymous poster who wrote, I checked on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Then I verified it on all 203 channels on my TV and satellite radio. I double checked it via the iPhone, and the answer's no. Now, there's another side to this argument, though. As we noted in our editorial, nobody recently has come up with an invention that's had as much impact as the lavatory with its clean lines and um, its sort of intuitive user interface. And although there have been advances in communication and computing, elsewhere there's been little to match the car, the telephone, the radio, and antibiotics, as well as the humble loo. And they all sprang from late 19th century and 20th century minds. So perhaps we're, not living, we're no longer living in an accelerating technological civilization. Instead of a new Sputnik, we're seeing the world's innovation engine sputter. Uh, to explore both sides of this fascinating issue, I've got uh, two most distinguished figures from Silicon Valley with me to share their perspectives. Uh, to my left is Peter Thiel, who's a tech investor. To my right for you, sorry, to my left for me, is a tech investor. Peter Thiel is a tech investor, a philanthropist, and an entrepreneur. And he's been associated with many well-known tech companies. He co-founded PayPal. He was the first outside investor in uh, Facebook. And he's also founded, or co -founded, founded a global macro fund, Clarium, and co-founded Palantir Technologies, which is a really interesting company that offers platforms for finance companies, intelligence, defense, and law agencies to process uh, all of the world's information. To my right, I have Mark Andreessen. Uh, Mark's a partner and co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, he pioneered a software a category that has been used by, was used by more than a billion people, and he's established multiple billion dollar companies. He co-created the highly influential Mosaic internet browser, and he co-founded Netscape, which sold to AOL for $4.2 billion. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz is a venture capital firm that provides seed venture and growth stage funding to tech companies and has $2.7 billion under management and Mark serves on numerous boards, including eBay, HP, and uh, Bump. So two very, very well-qualified people to address this, uh, this forum. And we're going to have a, a quasi-debate style. To kick off, I'm going to ask both Peter and Mark to speak for five minutes to make some opening remarks, and then each of them will have a couple of minutes to respond to the other's comments. And then we'll have an uh, open discussion on stage. I'll ask some questions of them both. And then we'll end with a brief summary from each of them. So Peter, would you like to kick us off? Yes. Uh, well, Mark and I have been good friends for, for many years. And I think there are many things we agree on. <clears throat> we agree that uh, technology is a good thing and is going to make the world a better place. Um, and we agree that it is the critical gating factor towards uh, taking our civilization to the next level in the years ahead. But I'm going to start by disagreeing with the moderator here. Excellent. And um, I, I'm not, I'm, I actually wonder whether this sort of perspective that Mark and I have is actually a pretty odd perspective at this point, and whether we actually live in a time when most people no longer think of technology as a fundamentally good thing. And you can basically look at all the movies that Hollywood produces, and I think they almost all portray technology that's destructive, dysfunctional, kills people, and you have your choice. Is the future going to be Matrix, or Terminator, or Avatar? And why not retreat into you know, a Victorian house from the 19th century? That seems like the best you can possibly do. Um, and so um, you know, I'm a little bit nervous about speaking to this audience in, in Los Angeles. And Mark, I will watch your back if you watch, if you watch mine. 
Now, I, I think when you reflect on why there is so much hostility to technology in our culture and in our society, <clears throat> um, one, one explanation I would suggest is that it has not quite been delivering the goods that it's been promising. And, uh, and you know, you have as much power in an Apple iPhone as you did um, computer power that was available at the time of the Apollo missions. But uh, what it is being used for, we can sort of debate how valuable that is. And it's like, uh, it's being used to throw angry birds at, uh, at pigs. Um, it is being used to throw sheep at one another. It is being used to uh, send pictures of your cat to people halfway around the world. It is being used to check in as the virtual mayor of a virtual nowhere while you're riding a subway from the 19th century. <laughs> and, um, and we may start to wonder whether um, perhaps technology's not quite lived up to its promise from the past. Now, I'm sure Mark will say that people have in the past always made fun of technology and of technological innovation, and they've said that um, they've underestimated when it's happened. But I think um, it has a very different character. When people made fun of the Wright brothers or the inventors of the automobile, um, they were making fun of it because it was strange and different. And today, the jokes are driven because it is small and trivial. In the past, the humor hid the fact that people were scared about how much technology was going to change the world. Today, the humor hides the, the scary fact that people are worried that there's going to be no change at all, and that we are living, in fact, in a time of general stagnation. Um, and this is certainly reflected in very broad indicators. Uh, wages have been stagnant in the US for 40 years. 80% of the uh, population in the US thinks the next generation will be less well off than the current generation. And while I know you can't make a one-to-one -one mapping between macroeconomic data and technological progress, it is certainly odd that there's been a 40-year lag and that uh, the sort of technological cornucopia we were promised doesn't seem to filter down to, uh, to most people in our society. Um, one of the great challenges in this debate about how much acceleration is happening involves this question of how do you actually measure this? And I think we will try to really hopefully drill down on this all-important measurement question. Uh, my basic claim is that in every area outside of computers, there has been de deceleration since uh, the 1970s. Um, there's been no meaningful innovation in energy. Energy prices are significantly higher after inflation than they were um, in 1972. We still have not recovered from the oil shocks of the 70s. Biotechnology, we have one third as many patents being approved by the FDA as were 20 years ago. Um, deceleration in biotechnology. Clean, clean tech has been an abysmal disaster. Transportation, uh, not moving faster, but moving slower more generally. Um, you know, even things as basic as food, nanotechnology, you have the whole range of things where, uh, where not that much progress has happened. Uh, the, one, the one sort of big exception to this over the last 30, 40 years has been the ongoing uh, computer revolution. And, uh, and I think um, it, it doesn't seem to have been enough to really dramatically raise living standards in, in this country, but we can sort of hope and pray that perhaps this revolution will accelerate in the years ahead and that computers alone uh, will save us all. And some of us are doing more than hoping and praying and are actually working to try to, try to bring this, this about. But I would say that um, even if you um, measure the health of the computer industry, I think there are some things you can point to that are not as healthy as, as you might say. So if you look at, uh, you know, there was a lot of progress, 70s, 80s, 90s. I think by a number of measurements, uh, the last decade, the first decade of the 2000s, saw a deceleration from the 1990s. If you look at the number of people employed in information technology broadly in the US, it went one, up 100% in the 1990s, up another 17% in the years since 2000. And if, if you ignore the recession, it's gone up about 38% since 2003. So slower absolute growth, much slower percentage growth. If you measure it in terms of market capitalizations of companies, um, you know, the mark, Google and Amazon, companies created in the, in the late 90s, are worth perhaps two to three times as much as all technology companies in the US combined created since the year 2000. Um, so again, whether you look at it from the point of view of labor or capital, there has been uh, some sort of strange uh, deceleration. And, uh, and if I had to sort of project in the, in the next decade ahead, I think uh, we, have to, um, we have to at least be open to the possibility that uh, the computer era is also um, at risk of decelerating. Um, we have a large uh, computer rust belt, which nobody likes to talk about, but it is companies like Cisco, Dell, Hewlett-Packard, um, you know, Oracle, IBM, 
where, uh, where I think the pattern will be to, uh, to um, become commodities, no longer innovate, correspondingly cut their labor force and cut their profits in the, uh, in the decade ahead. There are many companies that are on the cusp. Microsoft is probably close to the computer rust belt. Um, you know, one that's, uh, that's shockingly and probably in the computer rust belt is Apple computer. You know, is, is an iPhone 5 where you move the phone jack from the top of the phone to the bottom of the phone really the sort of thing where we should be all screaming, hallelujah, it's a miracle. Um, now, I think the, uh, anyway, the, the one, one concluding thought on my end is, I, I want to underscore that um, I, I think of myself as the optimist and Mark as the pessimist here. <laughs> and, um, and it is because I think we can be doing a lot better. You know, I think we can be looking at a whole range of technologies, futuristic computer technologies, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, space technologies, biotech, next generation life sciences. We should be finding a cure for cancer, for Alzheimer's. Um, and I think it is not a fact of nature that the slowdown has happened. It's a cultural decision. We've become risk averse. We've been regulated to death. We've become um, incrementalist. And we're not willing to uh, really uh, take the bold steps. We've talked ourselves into thinking that, uh, that uh, throwing, um, throwing angry birds at pigs is the best we can do. And, that's, uh, and I think we can do better. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we'll move from our optimist there to, uh, to, to Mark. Great. So, uh, so it's a thrill to be here, and it's a thrill to be debating uh, my friend Peter on stage. Um, those of you who have heard Peter in the past know that he's one of the smartest people in the world on, on all these topics, um, and is also a very original thinker. Um, typically in our discussions, I find I agree with exactly 50% uh, of, what he, of what he says, 50.0%. I'm going to try very hard today to find the 50% that I agree with uh, out of what Peter is saying. Um, uh, since I, I, uh, let's start by saying I, I do agree that we could be doing a lot better. There's a lot more we can do, and we'll, we'll probably talk about that uh, today. But I also think the current situation is not uh, is not dire. And in fact, is I am quite an optimist on the on the current situation. Um, so let me start with uh, with another uh, thing that uh, Peter has said. In fact, the uh, the slogan of his venture capital firm, uh, Founders Fund, uh, which uh, those of you who have not tracked Founders Fund, uh, Founders Fund has become one of the most important, influential uh, venture capital firms in Silicon Valley, and is actually well known. Uh, for being a very innovative investor in areas like the ones Peter mentioned uh, at the end, uh, AI, robotics, transportation, space, uh, and so forth. And so is a, is, is, is a, is a, uh, is a very big deal in the Valley. Um, the slogan of Founders Fund uh, is a sentence that kind of crystallizes, I think, Peter's argument uh, in a nutshell, which is, we wanted flying cars. Uh, instead, we got 140 characters. Um, I can't resist. I would like to take on both sides, uh, of, of, uh, both sides of the slogan. Uh, so I'd like to start with flying cars. Um, so flying cars are kind of representative, right, of the technological future that was promised to us in sort of mid-20th century science fiction. And if you were like me, like Peter, you grew up uh, reading this stuff, it seems like everybody had a flying car. Um, many of the innovations, interestingly, of science fiction in the mid-20th century actually have come through satellites, uh, which Arthur Clarke uh, famously forecasted. Uh, the, uh, the, the Palm Communicator that Captain Kirk used to carry, uh, we now have. Actually, if you rewatch Star Trek episodes now from the 60s, they're all carrying around tablets. Uh, and, and actually, people didn't pay as That's much correct. attention to that because everybody wanted the communicator. But if you go back, they literally all have iPads uh, in, 19, in 1967. <laughs> um, and they even have little SD cards they, they, they put in them. Uh, we have those, even, even you know, very futuristic technologies. Uh, laser surgery is an example, uh, which was a staple of science fiction, uh, have come true. Um, other innovations, uh, in addition to the flying car, of course, have not come true. My favorite example is the meal as a pill. Um, at this point, we were all supposed to be taking our meals as pills, right? It would save a tremendous amount of time, beef stroganoff, right, as a pill. Um, I think given the state of our civilization, I think that's probably a good thing that we don't have that, um, because we would have figured out how to put 8,000 calories in a pill, um, and we would, we would all be even 300 pounds heavier uh, than we are, so I think that one worked out okay. Um, on the flying car itself, flying car is a, is a very interesting case, because uh, on the surface, it seems like it must be a good idea. Um, I find myself, though, agreeing with Bill Gates, which is a very uncommon thing for me, um, which uh, his comment uh, when he was asked about Peter's uh, statement on the flying car, he said, did Peter really want flying cars? Flying cars are not a very efficient way to move things from one point to another. Um, in fact, if you were going to have flying cars, they would be incredibly inefficient uh, from a power standpoint. Um, and of course, they would be far more dangerous. Um, anybody who's been to a DMV uh, in the recent past, just imagine the DMV issuing licenses uh, for flying car pilots. <laughs> I don't know about you, I would build the thickest roof I could come up with and never go outside. 
However, even beyond that, uh, even beyond that, even just cars, even transportation, Peter, we, we'll, we'll talk a fair amount, I think, about transportation today. Uh, Peter basically says we've stalled down in transportation because we're not going faster uh, than we did in 1960. In fact, in general, we're going slower. Um, I actually think the flying car and the idea that transportation is stalled out, I, I think is not quite right. I think that there are very significant changes happening in transportation right now. Um, and there's actually three categories of those changes that I hope we'll get a chance to talk about today. I think there's actually very fundamental uh, innovation in transportation happening, um, including advances in information technology that make transportation less necessary, right? Video conferencing, replacing trips, ask any business person is a wonderful thing. Um, and uh, you know, even within families, the ability for uh, grandkids and grandparents to be able to communicate without having to drive six hours through the Midwest like I had to do when I was a kid. Uh, I can guarantee you I consider that an advance. Um, that brings me to uh, part two of uh, flying cars versus 140 characters, which is the 140 characters. Uh, 140 characters, of course, is a reference to Twitter. Um, uh, Twitter, of course, makes an easy target because a lot of Twitter is, in fact, about what your cat had for breakfast and lunch and dinner and snacks in between. Um, but I think that that trivializes, I think actually the state, I think actually the theory of 140 characters is the best we've been able to do actually trivializes what's happened in technology and I think also actually trivializes Twitter. And so I will rise to Twitter's defense. Um, Twitter, if you think, if you just step back on a minute, if you step, step back for a minute and think about Twitter, Twitter is instant global public messaging for free, right? Instant global public messaging for free. If you think about the impact of that, if you go back into any previous era, right, the era of telegraph, the era of telephone, the era of television, um, you know, all Martin's predecessors at the, at the Economist going back 150 years. If you go back to any previous era and you tell them, instead of having the communication technologies you had at the time, I can give you instant global public messaging for free, they would have thought that you had delivered it straight from heaven. Like, it's, it's the most astonishing communications breakthrough they could have possibly imagined. And we actually have it, and it actually works. Um, and it's growing at an astonishing pace, and I think everybody's going to be on it. And I think it's a really big deal. I think it's a really big deal for business. Um, I think it's a really big deal for news. I think every reporter in the room would agree with that. Um, I think it's a very big deal for politics. Um, and then I think it's also actually a very big deal for cultural discovery, um, which is m m new online media like Twitter and Facebook make it easier for people to meet people who are not like themselves and make it easier for people to meet people from other countries and other cultures uh, and interact with them. And a lot, a lot of the experience of kids today uh, is interacting with people from other countries from a very early age in a way that, that at least my generation never did. Um, so I think it's a very, very big deal across all those dimensions. Um, more generally, um, I, I would certainly assert, uh, you know, there's no surprise probably to Peter and anybody, I'd assert the central role that information technology is going to play uh, in our, in our, in our civil, civilization advancing. In particular, communication technology. Um, like Twitter, communication technology is often disregarded or trivialized as, you know, people talk to each other about all kinds of nonsense. Why does it matter? The whole basis of our civilization, in my view, is communication. Right? Without communication, we would all be sitting in caves by ourselves, right? unable to do things, unable to learn about things, un unable to form into groups. Um, and the ability for people to be able to communicate and being able to have communication costs come down the curve uh, as aggressively as they are, I think, is a very, very big potential setup and platform uh, for what happens uh, over the next 20, 30 years. Um, and in particular, I think communication will be the catalyst for a lot of innovations in a lot of other industries. I think communication is the platform on top of which a lot of other innovation is happening by letting innovators communicate with each other, letting innovators collaborate, letting innovators team and combine uh, expertise and information uh, much more fluidly than they used to be able to, uh, to do that. Um, let me end uh, with a comment on perspective. Um, Peter uh, uh, addressed this uh, briefly. Um, in history, if you read history, the great innovations of the past are now well understood as being very, very important. It's very obvious. It's very obvious uh, the innovations of the past that, that, that turn out to be very important. Um, in almost every case, they were not widely understood as such at the time. Um, in fact, I would, I would assert that they were often actually viewed as trivialities or jokes. I don't think that this is a new phenomenon uh, to be this dismissive about new technologies early. Let me give three quick examples. Um, the telephone. When, uh, when uh, Thomas, Edison, uh, first Thomas Edison was first working on the telephone, um, the assumption of the use case motivating uh, his early work on the telephone um, was the idea that telegraph operators needed to be able to talk to each other, right? It was considered so implausible that you would have a system that would let any ordinary person pick up the telephone and talk to another ordinary person. Like, that was clearly implausible. That was clearly not going to happen. But you had all these telegraph operators all, sc all scattered throughout the world, and you had all these coordination problems between telegraph operators as they sent messages to each other. And they said, boy, if we could actually let the telegraph operators talk to each other, that would make the telegraph work a lot better. Right? Completely missing uh, the larger opportunity. Um, the internet. Um, I have personal experience with this one. <laughs> the internet, it's hard to remember, the internet was laughed at was laughed at, it was heaped with scorn from 1993 basically to 1997, 1998. 
Um, in fact, those of you who were in the industry at that time will remember the New York Times had a reporter on staff named Peter Lewis. Hopefully he's here in the room. Um, uh, I'm convinced he was specifically hired by the editors to just write negative stories about the internet. It was like all he did, and it was always the internet was never going to be a consumer media, and the internet is not nearly as big as these people think. Nobody is ever going to trust the internet for e-commerce. It was literally like every week there was a negative story uh, in the Times about the internet, which you know, causes me a certain amount of pleasure today uh, uh, watching the uh, New York Times company try to cope with the consequences of the technology that they laughed at. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I try not to indulge in schadenfreude. Every once in a while it sneaks through. Um, Finally, my, my final example, the car. So the car was absolutely viewed as a triviality and a toy when it first emerged. In fact, J.P. Morgan himself ref refused to invest in Ford Motor Company uh, with the response that's just a toy for rich people, which is in fact what it was at the time. If you had one of the first cars, you actually you had to be a rich person, which meant you also had to have a dri you had to have a driver, um, unless you were a very very uh, uh, advanced uh, rich person. Um, you often actually had to also have a stoker with the early cars to keep the engine going, um, and then uh, you also had to travel with a full time mechanic because uh, the thing would break down every three miles. So there were a lot of reasons to doubt the importance of the car. Um, my favorite example of skepticism about the car, um, and in fact cultural rejection of the car, um, there were a series of laws passed in the late 1800s in the UK and also in the US called the Red Flag Laws uh, at the time. So the UK Red Flag Law uh, worked as follows um, with respect to, to cars. Firstly, um, at least three persons shall be employed to drive or conduct any automobile. Um, which is actually not that crazy because it was already assumed that you had your driver and your mechanic uh, with you. Um, secondly, one of such persons, while any automobile is in motion, shall precede such auto automobile on foot by not less than 60 yards <laughs> and shall carry a red flag constantly displayed and shall warn the riders and drivers of horses of the approach of such automobiles and shall signal the driver thereof when it shall be necessary to stop. So possibly a little bit of protectionism on the, on the part of the Blacksmith Guild. Um, but still, a, a, a good sign of the times in terms of just the initial shock and, and initial rejection of the idea. It turns out that's not even the really entertaining one. Um, the really entertaining one was Pennsylvania in 1896. Uh, legislators yeah. unanimously passed a bill through both houses of the state legislature, uh, which would require all motorists piloting their horseless carriages upon chance encounters with riders on horseback or cattle to number one, immediately stop the vehicle, Number two, immediately. I have to give Peter a little bit of a chance to get back at you. I'm almost totally. done. I'm okay. almost done. I'm almost done. Okay. Immediately stop the vehicle. Immediately and as rapidly as possible, disassemble the automobile. <laughs> and number three, conceal the various components out of sight behind nearby bushes until equestrian or livestock is sufficiently pacified. Um, so the point is, the great innovations of the present, I believe, are virtually guaranteed to be viewed as trivial and to be viewed as jokes. Um, I think history, 50, 100 years from now, will enshroud them in legend. Uh, in our time, they won't be recognized as such. Of course, in the future, when they become legends, the, our, our, our descendants will themselves have their own trivial innovations to laugh at. Great. Thank you. Um, Peter, I'll give you some, some time now to, to respond to that, because that was an extended five minutes. Yes. Uh, well, let's see. I, th I think, um, you know, I, I do think the question, of, uh, the question of how one measures all these things is very important. So uh, it, is, it is true that it's hard to measure these things at the precise moment they happen. But that is, of course, what we're trying to figure out. You know, we're trying to figure out, are things accelerating? Are they decelerating? And I, I suggested you know, a number of different ways you could try to measure them. You could look at you know, how many people are working in the computer industry. You could look at um, the market capitalizations of companies. You could look at, uh, I, I do think there's something to be said for a common sense intuition on this, even though um, that, you know, obviously there are ways, the ways that that's uh, gone, gone wrong in, in one form or another. But I think. Um, the question really is, how do we measure? You know, so one of the questions I would ask for Mark to answer at some point would be, what facts would convince him that we're no longer living in an accelerating civilization? Because you can always find some anecdotes where something's happening. It may be a very big change. You know, the history of the 90s, I think, was complicated because uh, even though the, um, the internet was initially underestimated, it was perhaps um, in, in the final stage of the 90s overestimated. And so the mistakes have been made in, in both directions where people um, under and overestimated uh, things, and, uh, and there's sort of an important question uh, what we're doing today. My argument, my view today is that we're probably, there's not as much hype as the late 90s, but there's also not as much reality if you look at the market capitalizations the companies created in the last uh, decade. Let me say one note on transportation and, uh, and, uh, and Twitter. Um, I always like to start with a transportation example because at these sorts of conferences, people have traveled and they've sort of had first-hand experience with the uh, great um, low-tech airport security, 
um, that sort of has <laughs> taken transportation yeah. speeds back to 1960. Or Interstate 405. And, um, Any Angelino here will know. Um, and <laughs> which which yeah. is working less well yeah. than it did in 1950 yeah. or 1960 or, th or things like that. And while it's, it's possible that we're just on the cusp of some dramatic improvement, we have to differentiate the past from the future. And so um, my argument is, you know, 1750 to 1970, accelerating technological change, 1970 to 2010, deceleration. Maybe it will start re-accelerating, but, uh, but one should be a little, lot more skeptical about things that are just on the cusp of happening versus things that have already happened. You know, we were promised in 1970 that we were on the cusp of curing cancer. Uh, you know, it was Nixon declared war on cancer. It was right. solved by the bicentennial, 1976. 43 years later, you know, obviously we're 43 years closer to a cure, but we would tend to think that given how long the journey has been, it's maybe going to take a little bit longer than uh, people think, and most people no longer think it will just be six years from now. And so I think we have to differentiate very sharply um, things you know, that uh, have not happened versus things that are on the cusp. Um, you know, sort of um, better uh, voice communication technologies were already being talked about in the 1990s. Maybe they're about to happen. You know, hard, hard, to, hard to say. Um, certainly flying cars. Are, are not realistic. Listening to, uh, listening, however, to what Mark described as the regulations Wait. on the car industry in the 1900, they were much nicer then than they would be to flying cars today. <laughs> and he so, didn't even um, mention sequestration, where all know, the FAA control yeah, is disappeared. Yeah, yes, yeah. so flying cars would, they would uh, not even get off the ground today. No, right. bad, bad pun. But, uh, but, I think, um, but I think the flying car issue and the transportation issue um, is really a link to a fundamental lack of innovation in energy. If I had to sort of say, what sector is the one that really matters? It's energy. When I've, when I've looked at this over, over time, you look at the amount of energy input into an economy is very close proxy for GDP growth. Uh, and we've had a lot of progress in computers, and we've had a lot of resource depletion in energy over the last 40 years. And that's, I think, uh, why we've had a sort of sheer force on the American economy, where it's like the uh, Red Queen's race in Alice in Wonderland, where you're running faster and faster, and you end up staying in just the exact same place. Um, and so I think the... Uh, the main reason we don't have flying cars is they would take up too much oil. Um, it's the main reason you don't, you don't even have helicopters going from the San Francisco airport to the Oakland airport to San Francisco, which you did have in the 1970s. It was a nice, fast uh, service. It got stopped after 1973 with the oil shock. has never been reintroduced. Uh, and so I think uh, there are sort of a lot of uh, ways in which uh, these technologies point to things that do not happen. Now, the, the, my general critique of Twitter is not of Twitter as a company, I should make that clear. I think it is a perfectly fine company. It's valued at about $10 billion. I think that's, a, that's probably a reasonable valuation. They have 1,000 people working there. I think those 1,000 people have great job security for the next decade, um, maybe better than some of us would think, but they have great job security for the next decade, and, uh, and, it, uh, and, um, and perhaps a lot more than people working at the New York Times will, or something like that as, sort of a, as, a, as a counterpoint. Um, but, the, uh, but, the, but the question... I'm out of jail. That was Peter. Yeah, I got that. I got that. I'm getting it from both sides. Okay, go but, the, yeah. uh, but the question uh, still is, um, it is a specific success as a company, but is this really the kind of change that will dramatically improve our economy, will dra dramatically improve living standards, and how do we measure it? And uh, if you measure it in terms of GDP, per capita incomes, all these sorts of things, um, it doesn't really seem to translate. You know, the 1930s, we had a financial economic crisis as well. Um, and in the 1930s, California was the center of technology, and it was the best state in the U.S. Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath, people moved from Oklahoma to California. You had the aviation industry, the movie industry, all sorts of industries that got off the ground in California. Um, California still is the center of innovation. The finance crisis was centered on the East Coast. Um, if, you, if you just take those two facts, you'd say California would be still the best states in the U.S. I think the demographics probably would suggest that people on net are moving from California to Oklahoma, which again suggests something about the magnitudes of how big is the tech industry? Is it enough to save all of Western civilization, enough to save the United States, enough to save the state of California? I think it's about enough to bail out the government workers' unions in the city of San Francisco. <laughs> okay. On that point, I'd like to hand back to Mark. Do you want to respond to some of that? Then I have some questions that I'm dying to get in. 
Um, but I, I'd love to give you some chance to respond there. So I think by now you probably detect we each have a response for everything. So I will I will I will I'll, I'll try to I'll try to narrow mine down a little right. bit, a little a, a little bit more. So I, I'd actually like to dive straight into energy and transportation. Yeah. Because like, we could spend the entire session uh, session defending information technology. I think people will draw whatever conclusions they yeah. there. But let's dive into uh, energy and transportation. So let's start with energy. So my assertion is we have tremendous innovation in energy uh, and it's stalled out by government intervention. So we have had actually in the last 10 years massive technical innovation across almost every dimension of, of emerging energy technologies. Solar, the price of solar has dropped like a rock. Uh, wind, geothermal, biofuels, fuel cells, energy storage, energy transmission, um, on and on and on. I think the, in my view of the reality, my analysis of energy is the problem with oil and gas is not that it's too expensive, it's that it's too cheap. Um, we live in a world that has had unbelievably large subsidies for oil and gas for many decades. Uh, direct subsidies to fossil fuels uh, per year are running about $500 billion worldwide right now. Uh, indirect subsidies are much larger, including most of United States foreign policy in the Middle East, ex-Israel, most of United States foreign policy, the $3 trillion of wars uh, in the last uh, 10 years. And the only reason ex-Israel for us to be there and to worry about uh, these countries is because of oil. Um, and so if I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not, but if I'm an entrepreneur in clean tech and I'm working on getting my $200 million in government subsidies uh, to try to get my technology uh, to be cost competitive against oil and gas, and I look at the trillions of dollars in subsidies of the, of the existing technology, I mean, it's basically a hopeless proposition. The technology has, however, continued to advance. Generally, what's happened with clean tech is that the clean tech alternatives get to within about 2x uh, of the price performance that they would need to be at in order to start replacing oil and gas, and then they stall out because of the subsidy imbalance. Um, and, and people say, aha, it didn't work. Um, but those new technologies have not yet had the opportunity to come down the price performance curve that technologies come down as they get cheaper as they expand into volume because they, they don't make it to volume. Solar actually being the exception. Solar has now gotten to volume, so the price is coming down very fast. Um, and so these things stall out and people say, aha, it didn't work, aha, the subsidies don't work, and they ignore the subsidies on the other side of the ledger. They ignore, ignore the massive warp uh, of, of government supporting oil and gas. Um, so my assertion is we can have massive energy innovation. Maybe this makes me the pessimist, actually. We can have massive energy innovation in our economy anytime we want. Uh, what we have to do is stop sub subsidizing oil and gas. Um, now, whether that will happen in our lifetimes, I don't have the slightest idea. I do know it is 100% a political problem. It's not a technology problem. Let me jump. Yeah. Let me jump real quick to transportation. So here are the three fundamental areas of advances in transportation that I'm, that I'm, that I'm paying a lot of attention to. So one is vehicles themselves, and we'll, we'll probably argue a lot about this, but um, electric cars have made significant advances in the last 10 years, uh, including uh, Tesla, which is an investment of Peter's, Phen you know, absolutely phenomenal company. Um, again, at very, very, very low unit volumes, right? And so they have not had the chance yet to come down the price performance curves. We don't know how good the economics are going to get when they start selling at the same rate that conventional cars are. Which may, by the way, never happen if oil and gas keeps getting subsidized, which is why these concepts are so connected. That's one. Two, self-driving cars are very close. Um, Google basically has them working. Uh, Mercedes actually almost has them working. Mercedes, their new uh, top-of-the-line sedan coming out this summer, they had almost they had a very large amount of self-driving technology, and that they yanked it at the last minute because they didn't think that it was uh, they didn't think laws at the state level are ready yet uh, to handle uh, self-driving cars. Um, but they're actually very very close. So we'll talk more about that. Um, two is optimization, and I think this is important. Um, there are new technologies, actually interestingly, generally smartphone-based, um, around optimizing traffic. Um, and so the app that you might actually use today uh, is called Waze, spelled W-A-Z-E, and it's a mapping app that gives you real-time traffic, peer-to-peer -peer networking of traffic. It's like almost like BitTorrent of traffic or um, Napster of traffic, uh, where people driving around on the road are uploading all their traffic data, including all the location data off their smartphone and pooling it so that you know what's happening with traffic and routes right now. Um, and you, so if you use Waze, you can find yourself rebalancing your route in real time against all the other drivers on Waze, which are starting to be, in some areas of the country, large enough percentage of drivers who are starting to have an impact on traffic flows. Um, we have the opportunity to have everybody in the country using systems like this and then optimize traffic loads across all the roads and bridges. Um, there's actually a whole academic field called societal networking. Uh, Stanford's very strong in this, which is around the incentives to do exactly this. And there's a, I think there's a lot of reasons for optimism there. The point of that is, if we get that right, it really reduces the requirement to build new roads and bridges, right? Because we can balance the traffic, we can balance the time. We've never had the technology to be able to do that before because we've never had wireless communication and computers and all the cars, um, and now we do. Cars themselves are being optimized. We have the rise of the collaborative consumption movement, and we have these services like Sidecar and Lyft and Uber uh, that basically make it possible to share cars, and so we can reduce the need for cars, we can reduce the number of cars on the road. And then finally, replacements, I indicated, right? Anybody who traveled to this conference had a bad travel experience. Anybody who stays home gets to watch this conference on video later on. They have a fantastic travel experience. They don't need to leave their living room. 
The substitution of fancy transportation, I think, are going to be a very big deal in the years to come. Uh, high quality telepresence is only now becoming a reality. Um, and we are very, if those of you who have seen like high end Cisco telepresence systems, it's like being in the same room with people. Uh, and that stuff is going to commoditize very quickly. Very interesting. But Peter, Mark picks up sort of two common themes that I often hear when, when, when I'm reporting on innovation. You know, one is that, well, it's all the government's fault. So your energy question, you know, yeah, it, 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 there hasn't been innovation. But Mark's point, well, yeah, but it's because the government's in the way, number one. The second argument is, yeah, tech's coming to the rescue. Don't worry, it might look bad, but within about three or four or five years, there's technology coming. And, you know, you've got Ray Kurzweil, you've got George Gilder saying, you know, sooner or later, bioinformatics, every, it's going to solve the Peter Thiel concerns. He doesn't need to be worried because IT's come into the rescue. That's Mark's point on transportation. What do you make of both of well, those? Well, certainly a number of these people have been saying these things for a while. So there's some question at what point, uh, at what point does one become a little bit more skeptical of what, uh, what, people, what people have said. I, I would say um, I'm, I, I'm actually very sympathetic to Mark's point that there's a big uh, government regulatory problem. And we live in a world where the world of stuff has been regulated and the world of bits has not been regulated. Um, and, uh, and so um, if you were an engineer, when I went to Stanford in the mid-'80s, engineering was a terrible field to go into. Almost all areas of engineering were bad. Chemical engineering, bio, bio, uh, biochemical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, nothing, say nothing of nuclear engineering, mechanical engineering, industrial engineering, aero engineering. Terrible, terrible career decisions. I mean, we've been punishing engineers in this country for 40 years. People are not allowed to build things. You know, um, and you can see it with things like, you know, the Empire State Building was built in 15 months in 1931-32. It's taken 12 years and counting to, to rebuild the World Trade Center. Golden Gate Bridge in my backyard was built in three and a half years in the 30s. It's taking seven years to build an access road that's costing more than the original bridge in real dollars. So, um, so we, we have, it's been a bad decision to become an engineer. Computer science and financial engineering have been the two exceptions to this. I think financial engineering not so much going forward. So it's sort of been reduced to um, this one very narrow area, and everything else has been outlawed. But that's, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable explanation of why there's been tremendous deceleration. Right. Then the question becomes, is our computers alone Can enough to save us? And, uh, and it's very hard for them to break out of this virtual world when the real world remains massively regulated. And, uh, and you know, I, I think it's a very interesting question what will happen with the self-driving cars. You know, Will, will, will you be able to have them? Who's liable? Will the, co will the uh, company doing the computer code be liable if the car crashes? Um, and, and all these sorts of questions will be tremendous hang-ups in a super risk-averse society that we live in. What about Mark's other point, which was very interesting. He made it right at the end, so we sort of lost it. But this point about time lag, you know, if you look back, I mean, the Industrial Revolution, the gains from that in wages and, and living standards, it was almost like a century before they started showing up in British workers' um, pay packets. You've got, you know, a, a, a sort of classic lag about five to 15 years before communications technologies and IT technologies tend to show through in pay packets and wages. So that's one possibility, Mark, might be right. You know, th there's just this lag and we're not seeing it. And there's a second possibility, which is the, uh, you know, the argument that's put forward by um, Eric Brynjolfsson, who says, well, actually, what you're seeing is massive advances in technology. And actually, what they're doing is displacing labor. So labor is, you know, robots are coming out. Next year, I won't be chairing this. There'll be a robot here, C3PO, with my accent, and it'll be terrible. But nevertheless, you know, we are, as the New York Times and The Economist are all doomed to die. I thought I'd bring that. But nevertheless, you know, maybe there's two things going on here. One, there's a lag. And two, actually, what we're seeing is this displacement of labor with, with technology. Or maybe there's not that much technology happening. So that's the third possibility. Now, I think the, uh, the lag, the question is, how long is the lag? At this point, we're going on 40 years. Right. Wages have been, you know, um, mean wages have been stagnant, not median. It's not an income inequality issue. So um, mean wages went up 350% in the US after inflation from 1933 to 1973, went up 22% from 73 to 2013. Um, median wages were flat. So it's become more unequal, but even even if you had redistributed everything, it's gone up only 22%. Right. And that, I think, also, now, on the second point, in fact, there is no robot sitting there. I will, I, at least I think. For now. I think there's yeah. no robot sitting there. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's, that is a distributional question. So it's, uh, it's true that if, um, if computers replace labor, it might lead to more unequal society. I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. But, uh, but then you, you presumably create enough more wealth that you could figure out some ways to redistribute it. But, uh, but the problem is, there is actually not that much wealth around to redistribute. If you confiscated 
all the money from every billionaire in the United States. You'd basically pay off the government deficit for mm -hmm. one year. Right. And so um, it's, it's not that there's been technologies led to this incredibly unequal wealth. If you look at, if you look at, um, I was looking at this the other day, the Forbes list, 92 people who are worth 10 billion or more on the Forbes list from 2012, where did they make money? 11 of them made it in technology. All 11 were in computers. Um, and that's the narrative that you like to tell. But there were 25, and we've heard of all of them. Okay, you've heard of all the names. You know, it's, it's Bill Gates, it's um, Larry Ellison, Jeff Bezos, on and on. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, on and on. There are 25 people who made it in mining, natural resources, which are basically cases of technological failure because commodities are inelastic goods and people make a fortune when there's a famine if you're a farmer because um, people pay way more for food if there's a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. if there's not enough. And so 25 people in the last 40 years have made their fortunes because of a lack of innovation. 11 people have made them because of innovation. And we never talk about those 25 people. I could go down the list, you would not have heard about half of them in this audience. And so there's this incredible media skew where we're celebrating the technology people, and then we can have a secondary debate, how do we take their money and give it to other people? Um, and, um, and we never talk about the, uh, the, the, uh, the incredible uh, trend towards, um, towards inequality driven by a shortage of innovation, which is what you see in the fortunes that are made in oil, natural gas, things of that sort in the last uh, 40 years. And, and just coming back to Mark on, on energy, you, know, you say government gets in the way. I mean, when I look at the, the electrical grid, so let's not talk about generating the electricity, but distributing it. I mean, if I were Edison and I came up today, I'd probably like, say, oh, it looks pretty familiar to me. I mean, the last 50 years have been virtually no change. And if you look at the, the sort of R&D spend of energy companies I mean, managing grids, it's like 0.17% of sales. You know, you look at a pharmaceutical company, way higher. So you know, is there just not a fundamental problem in terms of the grid itself as opposed to all the stuff that's going into it? Well, when you get government-sponsored monopolies, that's what you get. I mean, that, 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 that is the consequence. I mean, in energy innovation itself, there are astonishing things happening. There's, um, uh, there are people working on wireless uh, energy transmission in the house, um, so to be able to just have everything in the house powered wirelessly, so no more wires. There are people working on long-haul uh, energy transmission. There have actually been significant advances in nuclear power, right? France gets 80% of their electricity from nuclear. You know, if you, if you put, there's, there's advances. Uh, Peter actually has an investment in a company, a uh, very, very uh, bright entrepreneur in Berkeley, uh, doing energy storage uh, in, uh, in air, in Lights compressed up. air, um, which is in incredibly interesting. Um, if you put all these together, right, you can start to imagine a different layout. You can start to imagine, you know, put 50 new state-of-the-art nuclear plants in, you know, have put countries up for bid, let, who wants the nukes, right. um, and then run um, long-haul transmission uh, to, to all the other countries, um, and then do wireless transmission uh, in the house. Like, there are completely different ways to do this. Um, but when you have entrenched government monopolies in these areas, and this is probably Peter, the, the, the main area of overlap between Peter and me, when you have entrenched government protection and government monopolies, government subsidies, um, it certainly is a big inhibitor mm. to that. And then at some point, people will stop innovating. Mm -hmm. At some point, you know, like the clean tech thing has gone on for a decade, but at some point, people will give up. And, uh, and I do think, um, but it, you know, I think the, there's a question why there's been a slowdown that's important. Yeah. But um, the question, I think, maybe it's, it's the government's fault, but. Because I, was, I go back to the fundamental thing: is we've had a slowdown in all these areas. We've not the innovations have not been allowed to see the light of day. But there's you know there's statistics out there from uh, it was a Brookings study earlier this year that said you know American patents um, you know, they're at an all time high patent filings. Our patent lawyers got are the, at an all time high too. You've, yeah, but if you look back in cycles, they, they went back to 1790 when American patents have been at a, a cyclical high. Innovation has tended to be at a high too. You know you subsequently see that innovation come through in the real economy. So I agree with you. you know, there's a certain amount of, of lawyer-driven stuff here. Sorry to all the lawyers in the audience. But nevertheless, you know, th perhaps there are some, really, some things going on that Mark says that we're just not really picking up on, but they're embedded in those patterns there. Well, it's, it's, look, it goes back to this, this measurement question. It, it strikes me that patents are not the best way to measure it. I prefer to look at wages, macroeconomic data, capitalizations of companies. I mean, the markets do discount the future to some extent. So if you look at companies, tech companies started 2000 to 2013, you sum all the market caps, compare with tech companies started in the 1990s, you sum those market caps four times as much. 1980s, close to the 90s, 70s, close to the 80s. So you look at it, you'd see a very big drop off in the last uh, 13 years. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not, all these measures are imperfect. I'm not saying that's the holy grail, but uh, but I think uh, there are sort of a number of these different ways you can, you can triangulate. Uh, I, I do think 
Um, I do think one can make both mistakes. You can make the mistake of being too uh, critical of things that are incipient and not gi giving them a chance to sort of breathe and develop. But you can also make the mistake of being too gullible. And if you think that you have this cornucopian future, that the future will take care of itself, um, you end up with a country like the US where you have a savings rate of minus 6% if you include government uh, deficit spending. Um, people think the future will take care of itself. You end up with um, one bubble after another where people have been promised that the future will be fantastic. And we've had a quarter century of one bubble after another in this country. Tech, housing, finance, I think now probably government bubble. Um, and, um, and they keep blowing up because you, know, um, you end up with a credit crisis when the present does not live up to the fantastic expectations the past had about the future. And so there is something very off with our calibration. The one, one, one anecdotal data point from 1967, um, was a book, uh, fantastic book written called uh, The American Challenge by J.J. Uh, Zevon Schreiber. It was how the US lived in an accelerating technological civilization. And what would this look like? And he predicted a lot of the computers, innovation, automation, and by the year 2000, because the US was accelerating, it would mean that it would leave the rest of the world behind. And therefore, people have to compete less with other countries. And therefore, the average American worker in the year 2000 would be working seven hours a day, four days a week, with 13 weeks a year of paid vacation time. Um, and even though we'd like to dismiss him because he's French, um, <laughs> um, we do have to, yes, you have to acknowledge that from 1850 to 1970, work hours steadily went down. And that's what happens in an accelerating civilization. People have to work less hard. And we're not talking about the creative people or the CEOs who love their jobs. We're talking about the average people who actually would like to have a work-life balance. Uh, you asked an interesting question earlier on, and I want to ask both of you that, that question, and start with Mark. What evidence would you need to convince you that your position is wrong? Yeah, there's, um, there's three. Uh, two that are in numbers, uh, and one that is uh, an intangible. Um, so uh, on the number side, it's, it's also actually the same answer to the question of, 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 of how do I measure innovation. So um, at the macro level, I, I, I think there's an input metric and an output metric, both of which are relevant. The input metric, number of scientists and engineers in the world. I mean, sort of the raw material of innovation are the people who innovate. Um, I think probably in the long run, that's a good proxy. I'll come back to the, what might be the problem with that at the end, but that, that's probably a good proxy, all other things being equal. Um, the facts there are actually quite astonishing. Uh, 2.1 million uh, natural science and engineering degrees granted in the year 2000 worldwide grew from 2.1 to 3.7 million by 2008. You know, an enormous takeoff of science and math and engineering education in the developing world. Um, the number of researchers increased from 3.9 million in 1995 worldwide to 5.7 million in 2007. So a huge uh, increase in the number of researchers. Um, so. Um, I, so answer to the question of what would convince me I'm wrong, if those numbers start to fall in a dramatic way, that would for sure uh, have a big impact on my thinking. Um, on the output side, median mean wages, I, they, they, they intermix inequality as a factor. I, I would prefer to look at per capita GDP, um, just look at the straight number of per capita GDP, and then if we want to work backwards into the inequality issue, we, we can do that, which is a very interesting issue. Uh, but per capita GDP, um, over the, as we all know, over the long sweep of time, per capita GDP actually follows the Moore's Law exponential. If you look at US per capita GDP, it's almost exactly the same curve you see um, on advances in semiconductor technology. It's a straight exponential curve uh, over a very long period of time, 150 years. Since 1871, per capita GDP in, the, in this country has gone from $300 to $45,000 uh, in current dollars. The other interesting thing about looking at this curve is you see these crises like the Great Depression and you see you know, the, the, the dot-com bust and they're these tiny little squiggles on what otherwise is this, is this unbelievable curve. Um, and so if we saw a sustained drop in per capita GDP, I mean, that would put me into a complete panic. Um, the final thing that I would look at is, is, is um, the imagination component. If we fundamentally lose our imagination, right? The, 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 the obvious critique of number of engineers and scientists in the world is, well, what are, what are they all gonna work on? And what if there aren't enough new ideas? What if they can't come up with enough new ideas? Um, and if we fundamentally stall out when it comes to imagination and creativity, um, that would be how, a real how would you measure that? I mean, be what, real concern. The problem with that one is, is it's an intangible. Yeah. Um, um, you can maybe measure it. You know, some a loose metric might be the number of scientific papers or something like that. Um, but uh, it's 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 a loose one. Patents, by the way, I think at this point have become an anti-indicator. Uh, Peter, I think might even agree with this. Patents have become an, the, the patent system. Actually, it's interesting. The patent system. All the people in our world believe that the patent system is fundamentally broken, um, like fundamentally broken in that it has become, you, you can almost prank the patent. Uh, you can basically, at this point, if you wanted to, you could file fake patents and get them granted all day long. 
I mean, the, the patent examiners have basically, as far as we can tell, have completely lost the ability to actually differentiate between an innovation and just another copycat uh, feature. And so there are, there are these patent you know, uh, machines, these companies that are generating tens of thousands of patents a year and not innovating even a little bit. Um, and it's completely broken. In fact, that itself might be an indicator that innovation is alive and well. Um, it's because innovation has now moved to the point where the patent examiners can't keep up with the state of the art. They have literally right. no idea uh, of what the state of the art is. So uh, patents I would definitely not use. Great. Peter, same question for you. What would it take to change your mind fundamentally about this? Well, I, I, would, I would still focus on the uh, broader economic data. I would focus on... Um, I would focus on certain specific areas of innovation that I think are very important. Uh, so, uh, so one that I think has decelerated some but still held up is increases in life expectancy. Um, they've decelerated, but they're still going up some. And so that's what I would look at very carefully. If that started going up again at you know, two and a half, three years per decade, as it had from 1840 to, to 1970, um, that would be a very, uh, very good indicator. Um, if, if that uh, decelerates further, it suggests the problems are, you know, the problems are even, even, even deeper. So I think there are certain specific measures that I think are, 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 are really critical. Um, I certainly think um, there is a cultural component to this that's very important. I, I don't know if I like the numbers of people in science. I think we have about 100 times as many scientists as we had in the 1920s. From, as far as I can tell, there was more innovation in the 20s than there is today. So that's, that leads me to think that that's, that's actually not that good an indicator. And I think... Uh, you know, it's about 50% of the articles that are published in Science and Nature magazines turn out to be inaccurate and un incorrect. And so there is sort of a lot of the scientists are sort of uh, not, not quite honest or are being pushed in ways that are somewhat problematic. And uh, we should be a little bit more skeptical of that whole enterprise at this point. Um, but I would, I would say, um, yeah, I would say if, you know, I, I, think, I, I do think it's, it is this, uh, this question of imagination that's very important. I come back to, to an indicator that I think is an interesting cultural one, sort of in Los Angeles, is um, if, uh, if Hollywood started producing science fiction movies in which technology was a good thing, that would, that's <laughs> really important, you know? And, um, no oblivion. And, and, and the, you know, the only ones I can think of in this are the Star Trek retread movies, which are still like a flashback to the 60s. Everything else, it's technology's bad, it's going to kill you, it's going to destroy you. So, if um, people here stopped hating technology and started using their imagination to uh, produce some good uh, science fiction movies, that would, uh, that would be a very good sign. Well, let's hope we can uh, make it so. Um, <laughs> oh, good. Just a final thought. Uh, we, haven't really we talked a lot about America and developed world, but emerging markets, a um, you know, huge number of people out there who don't even have benefits yet of some of the, the fundamental innovations that came through from, you know, sanitation, uh, electricity, et cetera, et cetera. So people say, well, it's all catch up out there. You know, there's no innovation. The innovation is going to come from the developing world. But maybe, just maybe, there's this huge sort of innovation coming from the ground up, sort of low cost, you know, the nano car, mobile payments in Africa really taking off because there's no, you know, banking system there to hold it back. Maybe some of those constraints that Mark was talking about that we have here could, in emerging markets, not be there. And maybe we will see in Brazil, in China, India, other places, a, a huge sort of blossoming. Maybe it's there already. Are you optimistic? Is that reasons that we should actually go away from here thinking we are uh, actually still in an accelerating um, technological civilization, or are you pessimistic about that? Well, um, our venture funds offices are, we have only one office in Silicon Valley, and we're going to keep it that way for the foreseeable future. Um, there's definitely been the sort of globalization of venture capital approach where people have tried to set up offices in many other countries uh, in the emerging markets. Um, the efforts have had met with very mixed success, um, and the business models have generally involved sort of a globalization arbitrage, where it's um, the, um, the Groupon of China or the Zynga of, of India or something like this. And I tend to think um, we like to invest in the first and best technologies. I tend to think that often the uh, something of somewhere is the nothing of nowhere, and, right. um, and therefore that uh, um, the, the, the place where the real innovative companies are happening it seems to have gotten even more centered on Silicon Valley. It's possible that once these countries catch up in 10, 15, 20 years, um, there will be innovation. But I think they are still far behind. Um, and uh, and the, the place I would look outside the US is other developed countries where there's room for innovation. I would look at Israel. I would look at Scandinavia. 
Right. Um, you know, maybe uh, Canada, maybe, maybe Germany. Um, there are other constraints on innovation, other cultural constraints in those countries. But I'd look at the developed world. The, the, the big place where people said things were going to get copied and overtaken was Japan. And Japan copied phenomenally. It caught up to the US in the 80s, and then it, it never overtook. And it's a very open question whether this is going to happen in these other places. And a culture of accelerating progress is rare. It's only happened once in the history of the world. Um, most cultures, most societies were basically uh, stagnant. And so um, it's a very important thing for us not to lose uh, the sort of accelerating technological civilization that we've had and that I think is at great risk. Thank you. Mark, any So I have, a thing, I, have, I have one final on this. So, one thing, so I pulled the numbers. So number of public companies in the United States went from 8,800 in 1997 to 4,100 today, right? So there's been a sustained attack on public companies in the US that has predictably cut the numbers. Um, on the other hand, the number of countries in the world went from, in 1990, 164 to, in 2012, somewhere between 190 to 206, depending who you ask. Um, and there are various debates about that. Um, and then there's this other new movement. The economist Paul Romer has this uh, effort to do so-called charter cities, to basically mm. create more Hong Kongs and Singapores, which could take the number of countries up a lot. The reason I bring this up is because I think there's an opportunity for innovation internationally that goes right back to the regulation uh, topic, which is regulatory competition. Um, so various countries choosing to specialize where they want to have innovation, what kind of innovation they want to have in their economy by the regulatory regimes. South Korea, embryonic stem cell research. Japan has liberalized drug development, big surge of drug R&D. Israel has commercial drone flights, which, we, which are not allowed in the US. The UK, uh, online gambling uh, is allowed, which means prediction markets work, uh, which they can't in the US because they're illegal. Um, and so there's actually an opportunity for countries, I think, to differentiate through their regulatory structures and to have new kinds of centers of innovation as a result. I actually, I agree. I agree. Yeah. This is just a, this is one place where I think um, you agree. We can, um, you know, we've we've been looking at a lot of these heavily regulated industries to invest in, and the question is always, is there an opening for deregulation? So space, there was some deregulation in the U.S. There was an opening for SpaceX to get started as a business here in Southern California, um, and I think on the life sciences and biotech, um, the question is, is there some tipping point where the FDA loses its stranglehold on the global drug market? And, um, and that's, that's the one I'm, I'd be most interested on that. Right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've sort of run out of time. So I'm not going to let each person have two minutes because I think they've given us plenty of food for thought there. Please, would you thank my panelists? <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Terrific.